given name is Paul McCoy. Um, I took on the Islamic attribute back in 1991 when I became a Muslim in college um, with Hanif Muhammad. I was born in Savannah, Georgia, and I was born to a very religious family. My grandfather is a United Methodist minister, and um, my mother later on became a minister. And my grandfather on my father's side was also a minister. And in our family, religion had a very, very prominent position. I frequently tell people that I didn't find God when I came to Islam. I didn't learn how to believe in God when I came to Islam. That was already firmly established before I became a Muslim. But um, there were certain things in the Christian faith that I didn't agree with that caused me to question it and later on to move away from it. So religion had a very prominent position then as it does now. And um, I still have a lot of respect for the Christian faith. I just think that there's a better way to worship God and that is to worship God the way that he wants us to worship him, not the way that we want to worship him. Okay, as, um, as a child growing up in the Christian church, we went to Sunday school, and within Sunday school, we learned about God, creation, Adam and Eve, Noah, Moses, and Jesus. And in Sunday school, there was always a distinction between God and everyone else. But as I began to get a little older, there were certain things in the Christian faith that I had to question. The first thing I believe that I questioned was about sin. And there's a concept called the original sin. And we were all sinners because of what Adam did. And I remember asking my mother, if I didn't do anything wrong, then why am I being held responsible for something I had absolutely, positively nothing to do with? Adam didn't ask me if I wanted any of the apple. So I questioned that. The next thing I questioned was, if God is so loving, then why didn't he just destroy Adam and Eve because they were the ones who ate the fruit. If you destroy those two people and saw it all over, then everybody else would be sinless. They won't have to worry about sin. And then while I was reading, God did destroy the world through Noah. And when the world was destroyed through Noah, then why aren't we all sinless? Yet we're still looked at as being sinners. And the biggest thing for me that I questioned was the whole concept of Trinity, the hypostasis, God in three persons, not three gods, but one God. I never understood it. I didn't understand it then. I don't understand it now. So as I began to question, the answer that I kept coming up with was, oh, the Lord works in mysterious ways. You know, God's understanding is beyond our understanding. And I said, I agree. The only issue that I had was one plus one plus one is three. It's never one. One times one times one is one. But that's a whole different type of scenario. So those were my questions while I was in my upbringing. And I spoke with my mother. I spoke with my grandfather. And I spoke with uh, people that I respected about the situation. And the answers that I received were inadequate. It didn't make me want to walk away from faith. But it made me want to come to a better understanding of what faith was. My first knowledge of uh, Islam or hearing something about Islam, um, I'm a 70s baby. And living in the South at that time, you really didn't have this overwhelming Islamic uh, presence. But my uncle had become a part of the Nation of Islam. And I overheard him and my grandfather having this conversation. And within this conversation, my grandfather said to my uncle, 
Elijah Muhammad can't save you. And at the time, I remembered the name Muhammad. It, it, it resonated with me. And I didn't have the opportunity to talk to anyone about it. My uncle didn't necessarily share what he learned with us. But in school, we would go to a world history class. And within the world history class, they talked about people like Buddha. And they also had a small section on Islam. So I began to hear a little bit about it and um, gain a little knowledge of Islam from that information. In fact, I remember being in one class and in the history class, they talked about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being in a cave. And they said he was in that cave for three days. He heard voices, he came out and he said that he was a prophet. Now many of my classmates, they began to laugh, but I didn't laugh because there's a prophet by the name of Moses who went and saw a burning bush and he spoke to this burning bush and he came back and he said that he too was a prophet. So this wasn't something that to me was impossible, but I needed to learn more about the prophet Muhammad. May the peace and blessings of God be upon him and his uh, progeny and his righteous companions. So my main information about Islam came from an unlikely source. My grandmother, the wife of the minister, when I was 15, 16 years old, I was an angry young man. And I walked around with this scowl on my face all the time. And my grandmother said, you have no reason to be angry. So I want you to read these books. So she bought me books on Malcolm X. Um, one that was, uh, that was, um, done by the CIA, one done by Alex Haley, and another one was like an unauthorized autobiography. So I read the books. The one that um, I enjoyed the most was actually the one by the CIA because this was the one that had all the pictures in it. But the one that really touched me the most was the one by Alex Haley. And as I was reading the book and I saw the transformations that Malcolm X was going through and how um, his life was almost mirroring mine to a certain extent, I began to see that in this country, there were problems. He experienced the same problems that I experienced. Not so much with the racism, because it wasn't as bad um, as I was coming up as it was when he was coming up, but racism is racism. And he began to do bad things. He got caught up in crime. I thank God I didn't get caught up in crime. But the thing that turned his life around was him actually finding the nation of Islam. By him finding the nation of Islam, he learned some things. He gathered good information from it, but then he went to Mecca and he got a better understanding of what Islam truly was. By this time, I'm a senior in high school and I can do research on my own. So when I went to college, this is when I really got into Islam. My freshman year of college, I became a Muslim, alhamdulillah. My conversion to the religion of Islam, uh, it happened when I was a freshman in college and we were on the quarter system. My first quarter in college, I was kind of a wild guy. Um, you know, you go to a college campus, you experience new things, you're away from your parents, you meet new people. And while I was there, I was doing some things that I knew that I shouldn't have been doing. And because I was raised up in a religious household, I found myself asking God, Lord, I want to worship you and I want to serve you the way that you want me to serve you. I don't want to do these things anymore because I wasn't raised this way. Guide me in the direction that you want me to be guided in. So ironically enough, I started going to revivals, different churches and, um, they had these nightly sessions when they were doing this preaching and singing. and It was like, okay, good. You know, I really want to get into this thing. But as I was going to these places, it was like I was still feeling empty. Because the message that they were preaching wasn't the message that I could agree with. They were preaching this whole thing about Trinity. So while I'm on campus, there was a group called Adam. It was actually A-T-O-M. 
the association of the original man. And we said Adam as if it was like Adam the individual. And a few of the individuals that were in the group, they were Muslims. So um, one of the brothers, uh, Brother Jabril, Sheikh Jabril, who actually went through Hausa with me, seminary with me, he was one of the brothers that I met. And they began to talk about Islam. And this brother shared a book with me. It was called Is the Bible God's Word by Ahmed Dilat. I went home and I read this book from front to back, from front to back, nonstop. And it touched on everything that I believed in. I didn't believe in Trinity. I didn't believe in original sin. And from the information that Ahmed Dilat put in this book, the Bible wasn't necessarily saying any of these things either. I found that it was a, a doctrine of the church. So once I read that, I went back. I gave the book to my friend. I told my mother, Mommy, I'm a Muslim now. I didn't even take Shahada. I didn't know how to. But I believe in this. I feel good about this. I told my mother, I believe in this. I don't believe in original sin. I believe that Jesus was a mighty prophet of God. I don't believe that he's the son of God. I don't believe that he is God. I don't think that he and God are the same in one. And I went back to the school. I saw my friend and I took my Shahada at the school. The following Friday, we went to the local masjid and I took my Shahada there. There the brothers gave me a Quran and uh, a sheet of paper on how to pray. Uh, when I first became a Muslim, it was um, a, a very exciting time for me. You know, you learn something new and you want to do everything to, to really show that you're into what it is that you're learning. And as a new Muslim, it's, I find it ironic that the brother gave me a Quran and he gave me uh, some Xerox copies of how to pray. Now, with these Xerox copies of how to pray, he missed a big part of it. It didn't have the part about wudu. It only had the part about ghusl. So whenever it was time to pray, I would actually go and do a ghusl before I would pray. And I would never do anything. If I had to use the restroom or anything like that that would break the ghusl, I would try not to do it throughout the whole day because I said if I did it, I won't have time to go back home to get the ghusl in. And so to me, that's funny when I think about it. Because I would see brothers that would go to the restroom and they would do the wudu. And they were like, uh, I said, w w what are you doing, brother? And he told, they told me. And I was like, wow, I'm learning all of these things. And um, I missed out on something as important as wudu. Um, <clears throat> as a side note, as I was learning new things, I realized something that we have to change as Muslims today. And that is... In the Christian faith, when you become a Christian, you take a class and they go through their tenets. Um, not necessarily their acts of worship because they're not set up like ours. That makes it more important that we have classes set up for our converts and reverts, however you want to put it. But during that time, again, it was very exciting. And for me, I said, I'm just a Muslim. Before I became a Muslim, when I did hear things about Islam, you were either Sunni, not Sunni, pardon me, because we didn't know the word Sunni. You were either Orthodox or you were Nation of Islam. There was no such thing as Sunni or Shia. It was only after I became a Muslim that I heard the terms Sunni and Shia. And when I heard those terms, people were talking to us about which side we should take. And in, in reality, it didn't matter to us what side we should take because this wasn't our fight. Well, at least we didn't think it was our fight. We said a lot of things us Muslims in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, it was your father Ibrahim who gave you the, the name Muslims. So that's what Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, gave to us. That was enough for us. We didn't need anything else. But as time went on and we began to know the history of Islam, then these terms Sunni and Shia became very important. But not important enough for us, especially as Americans, to want to go to war 
behind Sunni and Shia. My road towards Shiism, um, like I said before, we weren't necessarily too concerned about Shia and Sunni until we started learning the history. But even in learning the history, you know, we're told not to break ourselves up into sects. My best friend, he was actually Shia. His older brother had accepted Ahlul Bayt. And he would talk to me about, you know, coming into the better understanding of what Islam is. And I was like, you know, brother, you know, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been given to us. And, you know, we should just be Muslims. We shouldn't fight amongst one another. Let's just be Muslims. And one day while we were having these conversations, he asked me, he said, do you plan on going to Hajj? I said, inshallah, it's obligatory on all Muslims to go to Hajj. He said, so when you go to Hajj, how are you going to perform Hajj? I said, I'm going to perform Hajj like everybody else perform Hajj. Everybody performs Hajj the same way. He said, no, they don't. And that's really surprised me. So I did the research. I went to find out how the Hanafis, how the Malikis, <clears throat> how the Shafi'is, how the Hanbalis performed Hajj. And if you go into the books, you find that they do Hajj a little different. Different rules, different rituals, or whatever the case may be. So he said, now, either all of them are correct, or one of them is right, and none, and the rest of them are wrong. And I was like, well, how do you figure out which one was right? And my best friend, understanding my relationship with my grandfather, he said to me, who would know your grandfather better? You or his friends? I said, this is kind of an iffy type of question. He said, with his intimate details, passing on what is important about the family, who would he pass it on to, his friends or to his family? I said, of course, his family. And he said, so if your grandfather would do that, you don't think that the prophet would do the same thing? You don't think that the prophet's grandson would know more about his rituals than his friends would have? I said, that makes a lot of sense. So I went back and I began to read and study, and I found a book um, by Muhammad Al-Tajani Asamawi. Uh, then I was guided, and I read that book in one sitting. And I couldn't put it down. And I said, you know what, from this point, this is what I believe. Of course, I um, read the book, um, The Right Path, and also Peshawa Nights. And those helped me, but the book that really helped me bring me all the way in was actually Then I Was Guided. And that's how I became a Shia. To become a speaker um, was, was haphazard. It wasn't something that I actually wanted to do. A friend of mine, um, Sheikh Said Kulani, he moved from uh, New York down to Georgia. And when he came to Georgia, he always talked about going to Hausa. My best friend and I, we talked about going to Hausa, going to Iran and things like that to try to learn about the Islamic studies. But it wasn't something that, you know, we talked about it, but we really didn't have a way to make that come into fruition. However, when my teacher, Milana Fauzi El Siraj, was down in Savannah, I mean, part of me in Atlanta, myself and uh, Saeed Kulani, we would go to his house and we would talk to him. And it's amazing that in the beginning, he didn't speak very good English, uh, Milana Fauzi. So we said, listen, if you teach us Islam, we'll teach you English. So we definitely came out um, on top with that exchange. So um, what began as us doing self-studies and um, studying with Moana. The thing that made the Meccans come into the understanding of Islam and wanted to be Muslims was because the message of peace, love, and justice that was given in Islam. It started out as being two guys trying to study when we could with the Moana. It turned into a Hausa course. Um, Sheikh Safdarazi, uh, we, we benefited from his information. Um, our other teacher said, um, Ali Nawab from the Joffrey Center down in Atlanta, Georgia, 
We benefited from him as our housing teacher and, of course, Fauzi al Sadaj. And when I went into the housing courses, it wasn't to become a sheikh or a speaker. It was actually to learn my religion better so that I could better serve my Lord. This whole journey for me um, in the religious world had more to do with me wanting to be the best servant to my Lord that I could possibly be than for anything else. But um, after taking the Hauser courses, we went to Detroit, Michigan, and we had to uh, sit before a panel of uh, scholars, and we had tests. We were tested on um, Aqeedah and, you know, everything to make sure that we were legitimate so that we would have our ijaza or permission uh, to be able to go out as certified teachers. Um, while I was there in Michigan, uh, I met my good friend, uh, Sheikh Aus. And um, Sheikh Aus was instrumental. He, he liked my story. He liked the way that I related to people. And um, one of my biggest strong suits is actually comparative religion. And um, with him, we began to do an online television program, um, which was the Faith Collective. And through the Faith Collective, people would see the Faith Collective and ask me to come out and to speak. So from there, I went out speaking and I made good relationships with people. And alhamdulillah, I've become a speaker of such. And again, it wasn't anything that I planned on happening. It, it kind of just happened. And I really enjoy sharing with people, giving them a different way or perspective of looking at Islam, especially from the perspective of an American. Because regardless of of how it is that you think that you're not affected by different things, your background, your environment, these things make you who you are. They make you think the way that you think. And I think it's very, very important for those of us who are living in, in the West to have Islam explained to us from a Western perspective. Not to say that Islam is Western or, or Eastern, but that Western perspective gives us a frame of reference so that we can understand the concepts maybe a little better. Uh, being Muslim in America, especially in the beginning, it was it was great. I mean, um, within the African American community, you'll find that Muslims had a lot of respect, primarily because of the Nation of Islam. They had programs to help people get off of drugs, and they cleaned up neighborhoods, and you know they they looked nice, and they they were respectful. Nobody had a problem with the Muslims. In fact, um, you will find that the issues between Muslims and Americans, even during the, the Iranian Revolution here in this country, there wasn't a, a big thing of Americans actually hating Muslims. They may have hated Iranians, but it wasn't it wasn't uh, framed in the framework of Muslims. So, in the beginning, in the early nineties. We didn't have problems. When we began to have problems was after the first um, Gulf War. Then the face of Islam changed. And people began to look at Muslims as truly the enemy of America. And from that point on, things began to snowball slowly and then get out of control. And it escalated at 9-11. Because even before 9-11, to be a Muslim, nobody was attacking Muslims. You may have some evangelists that would say bad things about Islam, but it wasn't something where the whole country was against Islam. But after 9-11, Muslims became public enemy number one. And as an African-American Muslim, um, in my humble opinion, we weren't affected in the same way. Because... Um, the perpetrators of uh, who they said committed 9-11 were Middle Easterners. And it's hard to um, associate indigenous African Americans with the, that type of a movement. But right now, what you're finding is any type of Muslim, anyone who's um, carrying the flag of Islam here in America, you find yourself being 
more defensive. You have to defend your religion. You have to defend your actions. As an African American, um, it's a double-edged sword because what the media has done with uh, the African American um, males, especially, is they've demonized us. They they've made us uh, to be out as if we were the worst of all people. When you think about crime in in this country, the first people that you think about are African American men. And as such, you know, African American men are out here getting killed. And is and until this age of, of videos and things like that, you never found this thing where if an African American was killed by the police, it was always justified. Nobody questioned it. As a Muslim now, I believe that there are going to be times and situations where the Muslims are going to find themselves in the same positions that African Americans were. Because they're being, they have become villainized. Whenever there's something that bad happens, if it's some type of, um, I remember when the first, when uh, the Oklahoma federal building was bombed here in America, the first, per, the first group of people that they looked for was Muslims, Middle Eastern Muslims. But that terror act, that terrorist act was carried out by Timothy McVeigh, who was an American. So, um, at this juncture, being a Muslim in America, I'm an American. I love my country. I don't love all of her policies. I don't love the double standard. But this country offers us something as Muslims, especially those of us who are Shia Muslims. Number one, the opportunity to worship the way that we want to worship without being impeded. They're not trying to stop us. We have that freedom. We have that right. Um, but on the flip side of that, if we are Muslims, then what type of organizations are we in? What are we giving our money towards? And even if it's a worthwhile cause, if someone says that the, that the terrorist gave money and this person wasn't even found to be a terrorist, th that gets to be a bit much. But as far as being a Muslim in America, um, I've, I've traveled extensively around the world. And I will still have to say, I'm happy being here. I have the freedoms that I want. And I think that here in America, unlike a lot of places, the jury is still out on Islam. It's really funny when um, I think about the family of the Prophet, the Ahlul Bayt, the Lama Salatu Salam. As a Christian growing up, we were told that there was only one perfect individual. And that was Jesus Christ, alayhi salam, and the peace and blessing of God be upon him. And with that type of an attitude, you know, we all wanted to strive for perfection. But with that perfection, because of the Christian ideology that Jesus was God, it was this thing where, you know, he's not fully human. So we'll never be able to reach this perfection. It had that type of effect. But when I came into the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt and I found that these were perfect individuals, not only were they perfect, but the prophets that came before them, too, were masoom. They were perfect. They were sinless. Perfect in the human sense of the word, because there's only one absolute perfection, and this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Looking and learning and studying and falling in love with the lives and stories and examples and experiences of Ahlul Bayt throughout my life for the last 24 years has been one of those things where if there was something going on in my life, if there was something going on in the world, how the way that I began to look at it was, let me study this thing, see how it happened, which of the Imams in their life does this time represent more than others? And if I want the solution to that problem, I can go back to a perfect individual who lived through that type of time and use that example to push me through. Right now in America, I have to think about Imam Hussein, alayhi salatu wasalam. And the reason why I have to think about him is because here he was an innocent man who was being persecuted, who was actually murdered. And he didn't do anything wrong. I'm not going to equate 
all the problems that happen here in America with African Americans and the police with that. But at the same time, where was the justice for Imam Hussein? How was his family supposed to get through that? For me, I know how to get through it because Imam Zain al Abidin, alayhi salam, salatu salam, he had to go through that. Imam Muhammad Bakir, he had to go through that. And their examples gives us strength. It helps us when everyone else is falling into despair and they're becoming despondent, thinking there is no Allah, there, is, there, there are no consequences for our actions. These individuals bring me back to reality and I have to say, you know what? Their plight was much worse than mine. Yet their faith in God increased. How can my faith in God ever decrease? So the Ahlul Bayt, there aren't words that would ever be able for me to describe how it is that I feel about them. I had the opportunity to go to Karbala um, two years ago now. And whenever I feel bad, I feel sorrow, I think about going to Najaf. I love Karbala. I love it. But there's something about Najaf with Imam Ali, alayhi salatu wasalam, to know the persecution that he went through, that he had to endure, to know that he wasn't treated the way that he should have been treated, to know that the credit that should have been given to him, the way that he should have been celebrated, was not given to him. Anytime I feel any type of slight about anything, I go to Najaf. And I had the opportunity to read Dua Kamel in the Haram of Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. And it brought tears to my eyes. What type of a man would, would Allah allow his prophet to entrust with this Dua and to give it to us, for us to have and fall back on if you read the Dua Kamel. And you don't just read it to recite it because it happens on Thursday. But you read it with understanding and you read it while pondering over what's being said. It changes your whole life. And it helps us to try to ascend to this perfection. Imam Ali alayhi salatu salam said, There are two things that are pushing you towards perfection. Night and day. Because when you die, there's no more sin. There's no more of the unknown. Everything is open for you. Because I know this, my life is always full. Because I know that someday, today, tomorrow, next week, next year, whenever, I'm going to meet my Lord. How am I going to meet him? Inshallah, I want to meet him the same way that my imams met them. Lord.